it's a green field. The, the amount of things that can be done in Latin America overall, just pick the country. You know, you have countries with populations of 20 million that are doing 2,000 cycles, 3,000 cycles, 50 million, 4,000 cycles, right? The, the conversation, I think, should be how can we get into Latin America straying away from the traditional model that we see in the U.S. and Europe? This episode was brought to you by Bundle. To learn more about the Bundle with Medications program and how they can optimize treatments for your practice and patients, please visit www.bundlefertility.com slash medications dash cost. That's B-U-N-D-L fertility dot com slash medications dash cost. Today's advertiser helped make the production and delivery of this episode possible for free to you. But the themes expressed by the guests do not necessarily reflect the views of Inside Reproductive Health nor of the advertiser. The advertiser does not have editorial control over the content of this episode, and the guest's appearance is not an endorsement of the advertiser. This IVF market just keeps getting bigger. The number of people in the world that need IVF services is much greater than the number of people that are getting it now. It is much greater than any one given country. That's part of the reason why we've been covering so many different regions and players in different regions on Inside Reproductive Health recently. Because you didn't see many national players 10 or 20 years ago. Now you see plenty. And now we're starting to see those national players from different nations become global players. The region we zoomed in on today is Latin America, because from Mexico to the bottom of the South American continent lives a population about double that of the United States. Yes, this is for the execs and docs that aren't the most familiar with the Latin American market yet, but you practice owners, lab directors, and executives in Latin America. I want your feedback, and I want you to share this with your audience, because whenever I delve into a new region or a new topic, I start broadly. The more you ping me with, you should have mentioned this data set, you left out this player, you left out this development, the more specific we make our content, the better it gets. So if you want to see more content about Latin America, give me your feedback about this episode and give it to my guest, Daniel Madero. Because I approach this topic broadly, I needed someone that's seen a lot of different areas of both the industry and the clinic side in Latin America and globally for some context as to how it compares. Daniel was the chief financial officer of a clinic in Colombia before it was acquired by Eugen, then its general manager after the acquisition. He's been a consultant. He's led biz dev, corporate partnerships, third-party services in different areas of the quote industry side. And he takes us through the countries that have the biggest market share, starting with the top three, what their market share share is, how many IVF cycles they're doing, how many IVF cycles they're doing per million people, how that compares to a country like the US or a really advanced IVF country like Israel. He talks to us about regulation, like same-sex gestational carriers or gestational carriers for same-sex couples going through IVF now being allowed in. Daniel, welcome to Inside Reproductive Health. Thank you, Griffin. It's a pleasure to be here with you. You're going to take on a new geography today, one I haven't covered on the show before. So you're swimming into new waters. We've started to cover more of Europe, more of the UK, some of India, some of East Asia and Southeast Asia. Really have not even had one topic on Latin America that is until today. And I think that it is beyond due time. And I want to to uh, delve into it partly because I think that we're going to see more of this consolidation. As you and I speak, there's a number of fertility networks that are for sale that are already cross-continental that may likely be purchased by other cross-continental buyers. I suspect that we're going to see more of that. And so I just don't think it's going to be this backyard or that backyard in the future, even if globalization slows down for a while. So let's maybe start broadly with just what's going on in the IVF market in Latin America right now? You know, I have to say, you've had other Latin Americans in your podcast. (laughs) I have had Latin uh... Americans. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, I have had Latin Americans on the podcast, but I've never talked about Latin America. No, no. (laughs) So overall, Latin America is a, a special place because... We have twice the population of the U.S. at about 350 million, but only a fraction of IVF cycles. Um, 
within the space, you're going to see that there are major players. We'll talk about it today. But um, the, the rest of the continent is lagging behind. So we have Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico uh, leading the way in that order. And then the rest of the continent is uh, it's smaller on end. So in total, we're doing about 107,000 cycles, including uh, egg freezing, transfers, like fresh and frozen uh, transfers, um, egg donation. So, you know, in total, and this is projected, so about 85% of IVF centers uh, report into Red Lara, which is, you know, the equivalent of ASRM or ASHRAE for Latin America. Um, and this 106,000 uh, represents the the potential total uh, with ex- those extra 15%. So a hundred, so about a hundred thousand. You're saying from all the way from Mexico down to Chile and Argentina. We're talking about Mexico, Central America, South America. And we've got a hundred thousand cycles, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more, coming from all of those countries. Mm-hmm. Correct. And that total population you said is twice the the U.S. So from all the way from Mexico down to the tip of South America, we're talking about six hundred or so million. Yeah. So we double the population. And we only do one third of the cycles. Uh, so, are we seeing a really unequal distribution in terms? You already said there is an unequal distribution in that Brazil, Argentina, Mexico leading the way, and then and then it's a distant fourth from there. Is is Brazil like? Is there market? What's the market share chunks of those countries? Do you know? So, Brazil is gonna uh, represent about forty three percent of cycles followed by Argentina at 20% of cycles and then Mexico at 15% of cycles. Everything else, you know, the the fourth one is uh, Peru at 7.5% and uh, Chile at 5%. I'm not surprised by Brazil leading the way. I am a little bit surprised that Mexico is a little bit further behind because we're talking about, I think, what is it, 110 million? Or are we talking about somewhere around 100 million mm-hmm. in population in Mexico? And uh, it seems to me like with the explosion of new tech industry and a lot of reshoring that's coming back to the U.S., a lot of that manufacturing coming to Mexico is that part of the reason why you're seeing Texas just explode. You're in Austin. You're part of the reason why you're seeing that area blow up is because you have the tech sphere in Austin and then you have the the semi-skilled manufacturing in Mexico with regard to that. that that's how it's called in the channel. And uh, so I, I, I would have thought that given what I perceive to be an explosion in their economy, that they would have been uh, further ahead. Are they, are they catching up real fast? Is this 15% been stagnant? What, what's it like if we zoom in on Mexico? So if we want to talk about Mexico, I think let, let's talk about now more challenges within like each one of these countries. Um, and one of the things that is going to be ubiquitous across Latin America is the price of IVF cycles. And uh, they're extremely expensive compared to what a regular person will make. So what we end up with is that IVF cycle represents a higher percentage of their total income, thus becomes harder to attain. The prices tend to be uh, on the higher end. So, and, you know, bear in mind that there is uh, a difference, a major difference between pricing in the U.S. and the rest of the world overall. So in Latin America, you could say that for multiple cycles, like about three cycles, you're going to end up spending $10,000, $11,000, depending on where you are. and that represents a really high percentage of the total income of the patients. So if we're talking about three cycles going to at about ten or eleven thousand, is that just to the clinic or does that include meds typically in that estimate? 
I'm going to say that this depends on the country, but yes, it, it, this will be uh, Mets included. Okay. So all in, we're talking about maybe 10 or 11,000, where that could be 50,000 in the US, but it's still, we're still looking at something that is proportionate to income out of a lot of people's range. Correct. What other challenges are are our countries facing? So are they uh, are they seeing from as far as you can tell the same shortage in embryologists and fertility specialists that we've seen in the U.S. and Canada? On the one hand, in Mexico, that is not a challenge, just because all OB/GYNs in Mexico are trained with reproductive endocrinology as well. So any OB/GYN in Mexico can perform. Um, ART services. So in Mexico, doctors are not a challenge. What I have seen, though, is that embryologists, if they have good English, will often get exported. So they will be hired for by outside clinics. So from personal experience, I have a friend that uh, after being in Colombia, he went to Dubai, uh, did a short stint there, and then came back to Colombia and is now in Chicago. Perfect English, highly skilled, and um, of course, the salaries are going to be a lot higher in dollars than they are in Colombian pesos or, you know, insert the currency. So le- lesson to all the lab directors listening, don't teach your embryologists English. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to lose them. Uh, so th- then are there operational challenges that you're seeing that uh, are different than in the U.S.? I, I suspect it varies country to country, but are we typically seeing the same workflow where it's you, you, you call you maybe you get a referral you come for your new patient visit typically you do your testing between your new patient visit and your follow-up some clinics of course do testing before a new patient but most i think are still doing it in between new patient and follow-up what's the operational system look like it will look very similar um in you know i'll give you a very specific example in colombia a lot of the patients come from referrals so a lot of the times the clinic's name will be very closely tied to the doctor's name. So the patients will come to the doctor referred to by a gynecologist. Um, in other cases, you will have something that happens in Mexico, given that they can do their own uh, cycles. Instead of sending them to a clinic, they would rather keep them Uh, get them pregnant, and then keep that patient all the way through to uh, delivery. So you're going to see, you know, different dynamics, but for the most part, there is a referral system. It functions uh, in the same way than in the U.S. So you have um, lower cycles per, uh, per doctor, you know, so we're not talking about uh, doctors or clinics that are doing you know, 800 cycles per doctor, but on the, you know, on the 150, 200 cycles, 250 cycles per doctor, which is on the lower end. Yeah, I would say it's on the the lower end. And so you're saying that some clinics are practicing obstetrics, that they're keeping those patients because that would change the referral pattern. Yes. In Mexico, it does. And in Colombia used to be that case. Um, and it's changed over time. Uh, I cannot speak to Brazil, and then I know in Argentina, and you know here we can talk more specific about about dynamics. Uh, in Argentina, IVF cycles are covered by you know healthcare, so that's one of the other reasons why you see such a high percentage of cycles being performed in Argentina, uh, because they're just covered. Uh, unlike in Colombia, where We have a socialized healthcare system. So on average, when you go to the hospital here in in Colombia, you'll pay maybe a couple bucks uh, when when you leave. But um, when you have to pay out of pocket, you just don't like to pay out of pocket, right? Like you don't pay out of pocket. 
because you're not used to it. So when you see a bill that's for, uh, I was going to say in pesos, in pesos it would be millions of pesos. Uh, you're not used to it, and you're a little more careful of your money in those cases, right? Healthcare is healthcare. So if you're used to going to a hospital not paying any money, when you get to a fertility clinic and you're charged, you know, five ten thousand dollars, then you're like, wait, wait, wait. I don't know if I if I want to do this. I don't know if I have the money to do this. I want to come back to this uh, question of coverage in a second, but on the on the obstetrics part, I could see that disrupting. I could see that limiting some new patient mm-hmm. growth because if the I'm going to go on an assumption is that the reason why they want to keep the patients for obstetrics is for volume and revenue. They don't have enough IVF volume. They make more revenue if they keep them from obstetrics. But that, by definition, means that there's some type of valuable revenue happening in obstetrics, which means that an obstetrician wouldn't want to lose that revenue. And so you have, if you have a gynecologist that's also practicing obstetrics or, or their partners in their practice are, they'd be less likely to refer to that group, and uh, I, per, that could be part of the reason why you see fertility clinics getting less referrals in Mexico, if in fact that's happening. Yeah, I would agree. I, I you know, I don't want to say that's the case, but I can see that definitely happening. And I know that uh, that was a dynamic here in Colombia that has changed. Why did it change in Colombia? Because doctors stuck to just doing fertility. Um, so the other doc, the, their friends would know, Hey, this patient that can't get pregnant, instead of me trying to do, you know, a seventh IUI, I'm just going to send it to Dr. X, Dr. Madero, my dad, and my dad would return a pregnant, um, patient. So it made more sense to just ship out everything that they couldn't do. And then get back a pregnant patient, which is where the, which is the revenue they're looking for. Now, here's the other thing in Mexico. You have, um, you have doctors taking patients to labs. So that's another model that is common in Mexico. There's a clinic and instead of having, you know, a set of doctors that are affiliated to that clinic, there are different doctors that bring their cases to the clinic. So say, you know, the clinic has Dr. X and that Dr. X is doing 30% of all cycles that are being done at the lab. Yet 70% of the cycles come from outside doctors that can bring their own patients. So that's another dynamic that you see in Mexico as well. Medication costs are a huge stressor for patients working through IVF and IUI treatments. They can be costly, and the variability of when they're needed means an even more difficult process. But it doesn't have to be this way. And that's why Bundle has streamlined the process with their new Bundle with Medications program. Bundle with Medications is a multi-cycle offering that includes all the patient's medications for one upfront cost. To learn about Bundle's exclusive virtual pharmacy program and how this can optimize treatments for your practice and patients, Please visit www.bundlefertility.com slash medications dash cost. That's B-U-N-D-L fertility.com slash medications dash cost. So I wonder if it's a question of like just where the development phase in the marketplace is and Colombia has reached that level of maturity and development where they now can have fertility specialists that only do fertility cases and and so they don't they're, they're not practicing obstetrics is that on the i know i'm asking you to speculate so maybe you can't but is that on the horizon from what you can tell in mexico or or do you think that fertility specialists are going to be practicing obstetrics for a while that is a really good question that I, I i cannot speculate on that to be honest i would you know i would try to ask paco for example <laughs> he might he might have a better idea on it and this is how I approach all of these topics is I start really broadly. And then the more I do, the more I'm able to zoom in and ask better questions. And any one of these countries, particularly the top three, could be their, could be their own topic. And then you could have mm-hmm. uh, certain players in each of those three that could be their own topic. So uh, you mentioned I, my assumption would have been 
and this is why we don't assume, but my assumption would have been, I didn't conclude it, that uh, the entire Latin American IVF market was cash pay or almost 100%. But you said in Argentina, the, the government pays for cycles? Yeah. So if you, I was reading the law this morning, actually, and I think it's if you're a woman that is looking to do IVF, it will be covered with your own eggs up to 44. Two cycles, one cycle. I don't have specific numbers, to be honest. So that would, because it, it, it did kind of surprise me to see Argentina almost double what Mexico yeah. is in terms of their their share of the Latin American IVF market. Argentina is a smaller country by population, prob- probably a higher per capita wealth, but uh, it's still... So Mexico? Me. I don't well, know. per that, capita, I mean, like the to- the total. Like, so, um, if you took the averages of of, yeah. of of Buenos Aires, but I would imagine, again, now I'm really, sp- I, I might really be sticking my foot in my mouth and talking about what I <laughs> what I don't know. I'm t- so it's just a guess, but I would suspect that Mexico has a higher GDP total, uh, but but the per capita wealth is is higher in in Argentina would would be my guess. But so. Uh, so they're they're paying for for cycles down there. Are there other countries in Latin America where they're paying for IVF besides Argentina? Yeah, Peru. Oh well, no, actually that uh, that IVF is covered. You mean? Yes. Uh, I don't know. To I I don't know to what degree. I know that here in Colombia there is a there's a push to try to get it covered, given that you know. Most of healthcare is socialized. Why not IVF, right? It's still a disease, right? Um, so th- that there has been a push to try to get that through, and it's been really difficult. Uh, I don't know how it works in Brazil. Uh, I don't think it's covered. I think it's cash pay. Uh, the one that I'm sure of is Argentina. I would, I would like to say Chile, but like looking at the numbers, maybe, maybe not because. Chile is a very small country anyways, so uh, I wouldn't really know. So what's happening with regard to people trying to scale IVF in these markets? So in the U.S., it's all about let's get from 250,000 to at least 2 million cycles. We need to be automating the lab. We need to be uh, practicing at top of license. We need to be training more specialists in advance practice providers we need artificial intelligence for case management uh and you have a lot of players and by players i mean on the vendor side these are the people that we see in booths at estuary and asrm that are trying to break into the u.s market some with more success than others are people trying to break into the latin american market in the same way like do they see it as an opportunity where well if we can really drive the cost down then then the market's even bigger or is the u.s the place where people generally want to try to do that because the margins are greater up front and then 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 if they can scale in the u.s that they'll be able to take some of those economies of scale to to higher population lower per capita income regions like the indian subcontinent latin america So I'm going to go on a small tangent that I think it's related to this. But if you think about all the different technology that we have in IVF, it's the same across the board, be it in India, China, Colombia, the U.S. What we have is the same incubators, the same laminar flow cabins. You have, you know, state-of-the-art labs. All of those are very expensive. And if you have a weak currency, setting up one of those labs is going to be way more expensive. So to give you an idea, um, when I set up a lab here, like a clinic here in the US, in Colombia, the price of all the equipment was put here in my lab about 30% to 40% more expensive than what it would have been in Spain or in Europe or in the U.S., so that right there, it's an indication that there's something that's happening within that it's the media is more expensive. 
the uh, petri dishes are more expensive. The X, Y, Z, just, you know, put it in there because most of it is made in dollars. So with all these technologies that you're talking about, if they're going to be charging $500 a patient, then in a country like uh, Argentina, that is now going to represent about, uh, you know, 25% of the total um, cost of the cycle. So I don't think we're doing the same. I think that we've been looking at how things are being done in the U.S. and Europe and basing it on that. And when you just transpose whatever it's being done elsewhere here, the prices are not going to change much. The other part is medication. Medications are extremely expensive. Nevertheless, they're not as expensive as in the U.S., right? Like, for example, this is this is a conversation I uh, bumped into the other day with someone in the U.S., and Menopure uh, was considered the low-cost option here in Colombia versus a Gonalef or Folistim. So when you think about that, now you bring a completely new dimension into the equation, right? Medication ends up being a higher percentage of the total cost of the full cycle than what it would be elsewhere. All of that because, you know, things are being brought in in dollars. And when the dollar goes up and the peso goes down, that means that, you know, intrinsically IVF is going to get more expensive. Has that happened in the last three years with inflation? So I, the only Latin American currency that I follow is the Boliviano, and it <laughs> hasn't changed. It is, it's hooked to the U.S. dollar. It's always around six point nine. Sometimes you'll see it six point eight something. You you'll, might see it six point nine. It's always around six point nine, somewhere around there, and uh, and even with. Um, the inflation that we've had post 2020 through 2022 and maybe even and now uh it it hasn't gone uh it hasn't gone up uh it, it hasn't changed it's always hooked to whatever the u.s dollar does now our and you can get a ton of variance in latin america especially in argentina where when i was living in latin america argentina had 40 percent inflation year over year and that, that wasn't like a covid stimulus no. except that was like that was like the status quo and so um so did did we see like an extra did, did this come into play more with the inflation that ha happened globally post covid so i'll give you the the colombian peso example uh before covid it was sitting at let's call it you know 3.5 to 1 dollar uh 3.5 thousand to 1 dollar uh by the end of last year we were sitting at 5 to 1 dollar and now we are at four for one dollar. So it's like playing jump rope. Uh, Ten years ago, it used it was at one point eight two. So that has a huge incidence in uh, in the result, right? Because what ends up happening is when I set up the lab ten years ago, twelve years ago, the, all the equipment cost half of what it would what it would cost today to set up a lab because everything has to be imported. And now if you want to talk about local regulation, Brazil is a complicated country in terms of bringing in um, external technology, media. That it's, a, it's a completely different story when you want to bring in, for example, gametes. Uh, and all of these are going to be at a premium, if you will, just because of the currency exchange. So the challenges of bringing new technology in for example, here in Colombia, you're going to pay, I think it's depend, depending on the, on the type of equipment, between 20 and 40% taxes on the equipment. And you're saying taxes as in like an, as an import tax, import not, tax. not oh, you're not talking about the, the lowercase t tax of inflation. You're talking about actual government uh, taxes government for, taxes, for, for that 20 to 40 percent i want to i want to talk about taxes and i want to talk about regulation i should mention that you know, what you're saying 
on the uh, on the side of the the jump rope of the Colombian peso that that's just currency rate exchange. I'm not uh, uh, and when I, so when I say that the boliviano is attached to the dollar, I should be making the caveat that that doesn't mean that there isn't inflation in Bolivia. There is that because the <laughs> you know the the purchase power of of a boliviano and a dollar has gone down, and so. Uh, that's just currency rate exchange. So you can be getting it on multiple sites. You can be getting it on the currency side. You can get it on the purchase power side. And then, uh, and then you mentioned uh, taxes. Are, are do those really vary from country to country? Is that is that twenty to forty percent pretty standard? Are there some that have really high uh, taxes? And then, like Mexico being in NAFTA, does that change? Yes. It will depend on the country and it will vary. Um, I know that Brazil is very, you know, tends to be heavy on on taxes for importing things and it tends to favor locally made things. Here in Colombia, it goes up and, up and down, but it depends on the type of technology. Um, I, I would say it's similar in Argentina. Uh, also, if you want to talk about... Um, politics which i really don't want to talk about but overall latin america is leaning left at this stage and when you have governments um like leftist governments taking over then there is a higher price on specific types of products and services as well so you know you see those taxes going up and as a company if you're buying something that sales tax you know so you have the import tax plus the sales tax so it it just balloons to the point that you're going to be paying 40% more than what you would pay in the U.S. So before we talk about regulation, I want to see, so it seems like just from a cost perspective of materials, media, technology, at least hardware technology, I, I'm thinking HSGs and, uh, and things like that, um, it's it's going to be far more expensive because of the currency rate, because of the taxes. What about these AI companies that are really trying to break into the U.S. and Europe? Are they trying to break into Latin America or not really yet? They're trying to figure the U.S. out first, and then and then they'll come to Latin. America. So uh, I know that you know IVF two point is based out of Mexico. So I'm guessing and hoping that you know, they have partnerships in Mexico and are willing to uh, spread the technology down into Latin America. I know that, um, which one is it? Life Whisper Presogen is already available in a few countries in Latin America as well. Uh, and I don't know how the pricing structure works, but I'm guessing it's going to be a different pricing tier for a clinic in the U.S. and a clinic or a patient in the U.S. and a patient in Latin America. Um, but to be honest, I don't know of other ones that are trying to get into the market. Now, if you think about the reasons why, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play, I'm going to try to, uh, you know, put myself in their shoes. You have 106,000 cycles that are distributed to a pretty small total percentage of the population with a high price sensitivity in very difficult. It's not like you get one um, certification like CE mark in Europe and you're everywhere. It's you have to go to Colombia, you have to go to Mexico and learn how to deal with the Mexican system, with the Colombian system, with the Brazilian system, and you know, insert Portuguese here, Argentina, Peru, Ecuador. And when you're talking about you know a couple thousand, few thousand cycles, the legwork might not justify go, coming into these markets. So it could be a while before we start to see some major innovation happening, let's say, in Bolivia. I don't know who the, there has to be a, a fertility clinic with an IVF lab in, in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. I suspect that there there's I suspect that there's one in in Santa Cruz and there might be one in La Paz and Cochabamba. There's probably at least one in Santa Cruz. There are three. There's three. Uh, okay. They're doing in total a thousand cycles 
Oh, okay. the three of them. So you got three clinics doing a thousand. Look at you with the day. I, I asked Daniel to do some some homework because I know he's good with this stuff, but I wanted him to be able to pull up a couple of those numbers that I don't know. Thank you for that. So three clinics doing a thousand cycles. I, I, it, so because of the reasons that you just mentioned, the variance in regulation, the variant, it's not like, it's not like you're, you just get that CE sticker, you're good for the whole EU, you get the FDA approval, you're good for 330 million people in the US. Uh, you, you're you going from country to country, and some of those countries are, are so small a market, it could be a while before we really see mm-hmm. like a scale in innovation in, in a place like Bolivia. I, w- I would say so, right? I think the focus is going to be on those markets that are bigger. Um, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, to start with, and then trickle down into other ones. There are some ways to do homologation of certifications here in, in Colombia. So like, uh, I know that the regulatory entity is a little more lax with uh, devices that have gone through FDA approval already. So if you have FDA, it's easier to get into one of these markets. I don't know for other countries, but indeed that could be the case. If you have gotten through FDA, then getting into one of these countries is going to be easier. I'm going to guess, and this is, uh, I'm not going to guess anything actually, (laughs) rather not. (laughs) Well, well, then, then talk to me about what's happening in Brazil as an, as in what, in what ways is Brazil an outlier to the rest of the region? Because it's, uh, one, it's, it's a larger country. Uh, it's got a higher GDP, a higher per capita income and, uh, while none of you know not not a high as GDP, not a high as population, not as high as per capita income anywhere close to the U.S., I could still see it having a lot of what uh, these companies are attracted to in the U.S. Um, and and that it also might be more cash pay than the U.S. is right now could be attractive to uh, different people coming in. Tell me about oh, in what ways is Brazil an outlier? Let's start with. You know, average um, middle class yearly salary in Brazil is about $9,000, um, as I said, a year. The average cost of an IVF cycle is $5,400. Um, that's about 60%. It's pretty high. But if you look at the population of Brazil, there are a lot of people with a lot of money. I'm also going to guess that financial institutions are a little more advanced, thus access to capital comes easier. It's also a country, again, sheer size of the country. It's just a market that big. It's, you know, a, a big opportunity, however you see it. Um, and now we're talking about Brazil doing 50%, sorry, uh, 50,000 cycles. Uh how much does that uh, represent of like the total potential amount of cycles that could be done? It's just a fraction, right? Um, with a with a um, with a population that big, we're seeing a very like low penetration overall. So Brazil, uh, to give you an idea. It's doing about 230 cycles for every 1 million people in the country. In the USA, uh, we're doing 800 for every 1 million people. And, you know, the ideal, right, like the the place we want to get to is an Israel at 4,300 cycles uh, for every 1 million people. So I think there's still a lot of potential of growth. And like I mentioned before, just doing an IVF cycle is going to be 60% of your yearly salary. So just bringing those costs down is going to really open up um, a big opportunity in any of these countries that we're talking about. Now, what I know is that in big population areas like Sao Paulo, you have mega clinics, like clinics that are doing 5,000 cycles um, in you know per year, which, you know, challenges or like it goes uh, head to head to those big mega centers that we have in in the u.s like 
big centers. Um, so we have those in Latin America, uh, but there's still so much room for growth. Imagine if you took that number of 230 cycles for every 1 million people in Brazil and were able to get to the 800 in that, that they have. We're talking now about 150,000 cycles being done in Brazil, unlike where they are today, which is at 50,000. So one of the major challenges, and I think, you know, you're talking about technology. Um, one of the major channel challenges that we have here in Colombia, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Latin America overall, is how do we stop looking at the rest of the world and how they are doing things? And how can we figure out a model that works for our own economies, for our own populations? Uh, frameworks, like legal frameworks. How do we get to that? To give you an idea, Colombia is a country that has now uh, regulation. It's it's great area regulation, but it's legal to do surrogacy and um, same-sex surrogacy as well. And it's become a destination now. There's, there are clinics now that are just focusing on surrogacy here in Colombia. And that's a great thing, right? We are increasing the number of cycles we're doing. The caveat, though, is that we are not offering services to our own population. So the, the need is still going on met. And if we find a way to change the way the process is being done, say like a PACO uh, and positive, then now we are we're getting into the, the meaty the good of how can we grow the market in Latin America. So I don't think that the opportunity lies in the traditional rollup, which has been tried before um, with EV, like EV, uh, EV came to Mexico. Uh, there's a history with EV and Latin America. I don't personally know it, but it would be, for example, a great uh, thing to, to research. But Evie, Eugene, so, you know, the same group that's going up for sale that you put an article up uh, on a few weeks ago, they are here. I was, I was part of the first acquisition of Eugene outside of their nuclear clinic here in Colombia. And, you know, I'm not going to say it's not going great, but it's still not growing the market significantly like we should be doing. So I think the the key to success in Latin America is in how can we change process or how we can, how can we create technology or develop technology that suits the needs of our populations? Um, and I know that, and by the way, like I want to give thanks to, you know, I, I'm advising a company here in Colombia and they were uh, the ones that provided a lot of the information that I'm giving to you right now. But they're working on increasing access here in Colombia, right? Like, how can we take what we have here today and we improve it, we change it, and we get to more people? Instead of going to from, so instead of doing 80 cycles for 100 million people in Colombia, how can we do 800 cycles for every one, one million people in Colombia? And so as when you're going through this, you can't make legislative changes that you can't r remove taxes, but you might see some things as you're visiting clinics in these different countries that, that you think, but they could do this. They could do this. What, what is, what's the lowest hanging fruit that you see that if you, if you ran, if you were the CEO of that clinic group, that that would be one way that you're able to do more volume? That is such a good question. I would think it's the doctors, you know, REs for the most part, doing most of the cycle, and they're the ones that have to do it all. Uh, I'm generalizing. I don't know if this is the case in most clinics, in all clinics, but I think there's an opportunity there to offload a lot of the work to the different parts of the, of the clinic. Um, on the other hand, it's precisely that, right? If you're talking about going to a public hospital is how do you create a good 
referral uh, flow for those patients in need of fertility treatments. Because sometimes, and you know, I remember this from my conversations with ob here in Colombia, they would you know, try timed uh, relations for eight months to a year with a 39, 40-year-old woman. And at that stage, it's like, wait, you need more education, right? That's not, that's not how it's supposed to be done. Or, and, you know, at the eighth, ninth IUI, the patient would come to us and be like, well, I, I've done nine IUIs. What do I do now? It's like, well, there are other options out there. So general education, both to doctors, patients, but also those creating those flows with hospitals overall or ob groups, you know, insert however the, con- the country works to get those referrals earlier and faster. You talked about some of the key players uh, who are, you talked about, you know, Eugen, which is a Spanish company and owns uh, Boston IVF and they own Trio in Canada and they're owned by Fresenius Helios right now. You talked about EV, which has merged with RMA to become EV RMA. EV started in Spain and uh, that RMA started in New Jersey. Uh, but who are like the, who are the big networks there that, you know, like who's their equivalent to the inceptions, preludes, U.S. fertility pinnacles. Uh, and I guess on the, like, maybe there's not as much of a difference between the MSO name and the clinic name, but like the Shady Grove Fertilities, the Boston IVF, the HRC, like who are the really big groups uh, that are in, in Latin America and where are they? Brazil. And okay, let, let's talk about groups because I don't think there is or there are like big networks here um, other than the ones that are coming in from outside. So Eugene owns the biggest, if not one of the biggest clinics in Brazil, Huntington's. You have um, the ones in Argentina, same. They own one of those in Argentina. Um, So they've been buying the big ones, right? Because that's where the profits will be. You talked about networks coming in like EV and Eugen and uh, and those would be like the U.S. fertilities and the inceptions and the pinnacles. And then who are they? Who are they buying? Like who are the Shady Groves, the Boston IVFs, the HRCs, the 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 really the Vioses, the big groups that are in different areas that people are buying? Like who are those? big clinic names in different countries, or at least a couple of them. In Argentina, we have um, Sehir, and I know that they also have uh, a lab of their own. So uh, Sehir, Huntington's in Brazil is a major one as well. Sehir being C-E-G-Y-R, Sergio Papier being the medical director there. Um, You have Huntington's in Brazil. In Brazil, there are more than one. I'm just going to give you one. Brazil, Huntington's, owned by Eugene. Now, in Mexico, you have a group that's in Genes, and I know they have more than one clinic across uh, Mexico. Um, there's one in, in Peru, and they're the biggest uh, by, by a good chunk, by a margin. It's called Concebir. They're in Lima, but they also have, like, clinics in Arequipa and in other places. Um, here in Colombia, you have two big ones now, one called INSER, the other one Reprotec, uh, written the same way as the cryo storage in the US, Reprotec. Um, those would be the ones that I would focus on uh, because the, the rest, I don't know that many clinics in other parts that are gonna be as big you know, on, with, at that scale. It's a green field. The, the amount of things that can be done in Latin America overall, just pick the country. You know, you have countries with populations of 20 million that are doing 2,000 cycles, 3,000 cycles, 50 million, 4,000 cycles. Right? The, 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 the conversation, I think, should be how can we get into Latin America? straying away from the traditional model that we see 
in the US and Europe. And insert Africa, any country in Africa, it's going to be very similar. You're seeing a, you know, the sheer size of India makes it that it's an incredible market. But you're seeing it in India. You had a great series on it. Uh, but yeah, I think the opportunity in Latin America with 660 million people or 650 million people uh, projected to be like 750 by 2050, it's a massive opportunity that we shouldn't be overlooking. And we'll be getting into more specific topics about the Latin American IVF market as it progresses, but I needed somebody to walk me through the 101. So I'm sorry <laughs> that you didn't go too deep into any of the 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 particular verticals that we could have. I will want to and want to have you back. And for some, it may have been too elementary, but I think you, you got to start somewhere. And my questions, that is, were, were too ele elementary for your scope. But I think that this market is going to be one of the ones that you see a lot of, of big growth in, uh, whether it's, whether it's next month or in a few years, I don't have a, a crystal ball, but it was time to get the one on one, one on one out of the way, because you're going to see more of it. And, uh, you were the guy to come on and do it. Daniel Madero, my friend, thank you very much for coming on inside reproductive health podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's all, it's awesome to be on this side of the mic. Uh, and can't wait to see what else you put out there. This episode was brought to you by Bundle. To learn more about the Bundle with Medications program and how they can optimize treatments for your practice and patients, please visit www.bundlefertility.com slash medications dash cost. That's B-U-N-D-L fertility dot com slash medications dash cost. Today's advertiser helped make the production and delivery of this episode possible for free to you. But the themes expressed by the guests do not necessarily reflect the views of Inside Reproductive Health, nor of the advertiser. The advertiser does not have editorial control over the content of this episode, and the guest's appearance is not an endorsement of the advertiser. You've been listening to the Inside Reproductive Health Podcast with Griffin Jones. If you are ready to take action to make sure that your practice thrives beyond the revolutionary changes that are happening in our field and in society, visit fertilitybridge.com to begin the first piece of the fertility marketing system, the goal and competitive diagnostic. Thank you for listening to Inside Reproductive Health.